You are listening to pastthink.com audiobook. Please like and subscribe, thank you. 7. From the eight trigrams brazier the great sage escapes. Beneath the five phases mountain, mind monkey is still. 1. Fame and fortune. All predestined. One must ever shun a guileful heart. Rectitude and truth. The fruits of virtue grow both long and deep. A little presumption brings on heaven's wrath. Though yet unseen, it will surely come in time. Ask the Lord of the East too for why. Such pains and perils now appear. Because pride has sought to scale the limits. Ignoring hierarchy to flout the law. We were telling you about the great sage, equal to heaven, who was taken by the celestial guardians to the monster execution block, where he was bound to the monster subduing pillar. They then slashed him with a scimitar, hewed him with an axe, stabbed him with a spear, and hacked him with a sword, but they could not hurt his body in any way. Next, the star spirit of the South Pole ordered the various deities of the fire department to burn him with fire, but that, too, had little effect. The gods of the thunder department were then ordered to strike him with thunderbolts, but not a single one of his hairs was destroyed. The demon king Mahabali and the others therefore went back to report to the throne, saying, Your Majesty, we don't know where this great sage has acquired such power to protect his body. Your subject slashed him with a scimitar and hewed him with an axe, we also struck him with thunder and burned him with fire. Not a single one of his hairs was destroyed. What shall we do? When the Jade Emperor heard these words, he said, What indeed can we do to a fellow like that, a creature of that sort? Lousy then came forward and said, That monkey ate the immortal peaches and drank the imperial wine. Moreover, he stole the divine elixir and ate five gourdfuls of it, both raw and cooked. All this was probably refined in his stomach by the Samadhi Fire Three to form a single solid mass. The union with his constitution gave him a diamond body, which cannot be quickly destroyed. It would be better, therefore, if this Taoist takes him away and places him in the brazier of eight trigrams, where he will be smelted by high and low heat. When he is finally separated from my elixir, his body will certainly be reduced to ashes. When the Jade Emperor heard these words, he told the six gods of darkness and the six gods of light to release the prisoner and hand him over to Lousy who left in obedience to the divine decree. Meanwhile, the illustrious sage Erlang was rewarded with a hundred gold blossoms, a hundred bottles of imperial wine, a hundred pellets of elixir, together with rare treasures, lustrous pearls, and brocades, which he was told to share with his brothers. After expressing his gratitude, the immortal master returned to the mouth of the river of libations, and for the time being we shall speak of him no further. Arriving at the Tishuta Palace, Lousy loosened the ropes on the great sage, pulled out the weapon from his breastbone, and pushed him into the brazier of eight trigrams. He then ordered the Daoist who watched over the brazier, and the page boy in charge of the fire to blow up a strong flame for the smelting process. The brazier, you see, was of eight compartments corresponding to the eight trigrams of Qian, Can, Jen, Zhen, Sun, Li, Kuan, and Dui. The great sage crawled into the space beneath the compartment that corresponded to the sun trigram. Now sun symbolizes wind, where there is wind, there is no fire. However, wind could churn up smoke, which at that moment reddened his eyes, giving them a permanently inflamed condition. Hence they were sometimes called fiery eyes and diamond pupils. Truly time passed swiftly, and the forty-ninth day arrived imperceptibly. For the alchemical process of Lousy was perfected, and on that day he came to open the brazier to take out his elixir. The great sage at the time was covering his eyes with both hands, rubbing his face and shedding tears. He heard noises on top of the brazier and, opening his eyes, suddenly saw light. Unable to restrain himself, he leaped out of the brazier and kicked it over with a loud crash. He began to walk straight out of the room while a group of startled fire tenders and guardians tried desperately to grab hold of him. Every one of them was overthrown, he was as wild as a white brow tiger in a fit, a one-horned dragon with a fever. Lousy rushed up to clutch at him, only to be greeted by such a violent shove that he fell head over heels, while the great sage escaped. 
whipping the compliant rod out from his ear, he waved it once in the wind, and it had the thickness of a rice bowl. Holding it in his hands, without regard for good or ill, he once more careened through the heavenly palace, fighting so fiercely that the nine luminaries all shut themselves in and the four devarajas disappeared from sight. Dear Monkey Monster Here is a testimonial poem for him. The poem says, This cosmic being fully fused with nature's gifts passes with ease through ten thousand toils and tests. Vast and motionless like the one great void. Perfect, quiescent, he's named the primal depth. Long refined in the brazier, he's no mercury or lead, five. Just the very immortal, living above all things. Forever transforming, he changes still. Three refuges and five commandments, six he all rejects. Here is another poem. A spirit beam filling the supreme void. That's how the rod behaves accordingly. It lengthens or shortens as one would wish. Upright or prone, it grows or shrinks at will. And another. An ape's body of Tao weds the human mind. Mind is a monkey, this meaning's profound. The great sage, equal to heaven, is no false thought. How could the post of Ban Horse justly show his gifts? Horse works with monkey means both mind and will. Need binding firmly. Don't seek them outside. All things back to Nerva follow one truth. To join to Thagata beneath twin trees. 7. This time our monkey king had no respect for persons great or small, he lashed out this way and that with his iron rod, and not a single deity could withstand him. He fought all the way into the Hall of Perfect Light, and was approaching the Hall of Divine Mists, where fortunately numinous Officer Wong, a aide to the immortal master of adjuvant holiness, was on duty. He saw the great sage advancing recklessly, and went forward to bar his way, holding high his golden whip. Wanton monkey, he cried, where are you going? I am here, so don't you dare be insolent. The great sage did not wait for further utterance, he raised his rod and struck at once, while numinous officer met him also with brandished whip. The two of them charged into each other in front of the hall of divine mists. What a fight that was between. A red-blooded patriot of ample fame. And a heaven's rebel with notorious name. The saint and sinner gladly tangle close. So that two brave fighters contest their skills. Though the rod is fierce. And the whip is fleet. How can the upright and just one forbear? This one is a supreme god of judgment with thunderous voice. The other, the great sage, equal to heaven, a monstrous ape. The golden whip and the iron rod used by the two. Are both divine weapons from the house of God. At divine mist's treasure hall they show their might today each displaying his prowess winningly. This one brashly seeks to take the Big Dipper Palace. The other with all his strength defends the sacred realm. In bitter strife relentless they show their power. Moving back and forth, whip or rod has yet to score. The two of them fought for some time, and neither victory nor defeat could yet be determined. The immortal master of adjuvant holiness, however, had already sent word to the Thunder Department, and thirty-six Thunder Deities were summoned to the scene. They surrounded the Great Sage and plunged into a fierce battle. The Great Sage was not in the least intimidated, wielding his compliant rod, he parried left and right, and met his attackers to the front and to the rear. In a moment he saw that the scimitars, lances, swords, halberds, whips, maces, hammers, axes, gilt bludgeons, sickles, and spades of the thunder deities were coming thick and fast. So with one shake of his body he changed into a creature with six arms and three heads. One wave of the compliant rod, and it turned into three, his six arms wielded the three rods like a spinning wheel, whirling and dancing in their midst. The various thunder deities could not approach him at all. Truly his form was tumbling round and round bright and luminous. A form everlasting, how imitated by men. 
He cannot be burned by fire. Can he ever be drowned in water? A lustrous pearl of Mani 9 he is indeed. Immune to all the spears and the swords. He could be good. He could be bad. Present good and evil he could do at will. He'd be an immortal, a Buddha, if he's good, ten. Wickedness would cloak him with hair and horn. Endlessly changing he runs amok in heaven. Not to be seized by fighting lords or thunder gods. At the time the various deities had the great sage surrounded, but they could not close in on him. All the hustle and bustle soon disturbed the Jade Emperor, who at once sent the wandering minister of inspection, and the immortal master of blessed wings to go to the western region and invite the aged Buddha to come and subdue the monster. The two sages received the decree and went straight to the spirit mountain. After they had greeted the four Vajra Buddhas and the eight Bodhisattvas in front of the treasure temple of Thunderclap, they asked them to announce their arrival. The deities therefore went before the treasure lotus platform and made their report. Tathagata once invited them to appear before him, and the two sages made obeisance to the Buddha three times before standing in attendance beneath the platform. Tathagata asked, What causes the Jade Emperor to trouble the two sages to come here? The two sages explained as follows, Some time ago there was born on the flower fruit mountain a monkey, who exercised his magic powers and gathered to himself a troop of monkeys to disturb the world. The Jade Emperor threw down a decree of pacification and appointed him a Bimowan, but he despised the lowliness of that position and left in rebellion. Devarajali and Prince Na were sent to capture him, but they were unsuccessful, and another proclamation of amnesty was given to him. He was then made the great sage, equal to heaven, a rank without compensation. After a while he was given the temporary job of looking after the garden of immortal peaches, where almost immediately he stole the peaches. He also went to the jasper pool and made off with the food and wine, devastating the grand festival. Half drunk, he went secretly into the Tishita Palace, stole the elixir of Lousy, and then left the Celestial Palace in revolt. Again the Jade Emperor sent a hundred thousand heavenly soldiers, but he was not to be subdued. Thereafter Guanin sent for the immortal master Erlang and his sworn brothers, who fought and pursued him. Even then he knew many tricks of transformation, and only after he was hit by Laozi's diamond snare could Erlang finally capture him. Taken before the throne, he was condemned to be executed, but, though slashed by a scimitar and hewn by an axe, burned by fire and struck by thunder, he was not hurt at all. After Laozi had received royal permission to take him away, he was refined by fire, and the brazier was not opened until the forty-ninth day. Immediately he jumped out of the brazier of eight trigrams and beat back the celestial guardians. He penetrated into the Hall of Perfect Light and was approaching the Hall of Divine Mists when numinous officer Wang, aide to the immortal master of adjuvant holiness, met and fought with him bitterly. Thirty-six thunder generals were ordered to encircle him completely, but they could never get near him. The situation is desperate, and for this reason, the Jade Emperor sent a special request for you to defend the throne. When Tathagata heard this, he said to the various bodhisattvas, All of you remain steadfast here in the chief temple, and let no one relax his meditative posture. I have to go exorcise a demon and defend the throne. Tathagata then called Ananda and Kasyapa, his two venerable disciples, to follow him. They left the thunderclap temple and arrived at the gate of the Hall of Divine Mists, where they were met by deafening shouts and yells. There the great sage was being beset by the thirty-six thunder deities. The Buddhist patriarch gave the Dharma order, let the thunder deities lower their arms and break up their encirclement. Ask the great sage to come out here, and let me ask him what sort of divine power he has. The various warriors retreated immediately, and the great sage also threw off his magical appearance. Changing back into his true form, he approached angrily and shouted with ill humor, What region are you from, monk, that you dare stop the battle and question me? Tathagata laughed and said, I am Sakyamuni, the venerable one from the western region of ultimate bliss. I have heard just now about your audacity, your wildness, and your repeated acts of rebellion against heaven. Where were you born, and in which year did you succeed in acquiring the way? Why are you so violent and unruly? 
The great sage said, I was born of earth and heaven, immortal divinely fused. An old monkey hailing from the flower fruit mount. I made my home in the water curtain cave. Seeking friend and teacher, I learned the great mystery. Perfected in the many arts of ageless life. I learned to change in ways boundless and vast. Too narrow the space I found on that mortal earth. I set my mind to live in the green jade sky. In divine mists hall none should long reside. For king may follow king in the reign of man. If might is honor, let them yield to me. He only is hero who dares to fight and win. When the Buddhist patriarch heard these words, he laughed aloud in scorn. A fellow like you, he said, is only a monkey who happened to become a spirit. How dare you be so presumptuous as to want to seize the honored throne of the exalted Jade Emperor? He began practicing religion when he was very young, and he has gone through the bitter experience of 1,750 kulpas, with each kulpa lasting 129,600 years. Figure out yourself how many years it took him to rise to the enjoyment of his great and limitless position. You are merely a beast who has just attained human form in this incarnation. How dare you make such a boast? Blasphemy. This is sheer blasphemy, and it will surely shorten your allotted age. Repent while there's still time and cease your idle talk. Be wary that you don't encounter such peril that you will be cut down in an instant, and all your original gifts will be wasted. Even if the Jade Emperor has practiced religion from childhood, said the great sage, he should not be allowed to remain here forever. The proverb says, Many are the turns of kingship. By next year the turn will be mine. Tell him to move out at once and hand over the celestial palace to me. That'll be the end of the matter. If not, I shall continue to cause disturbances and there'll never be peace. Besides your immortality and your transformations, said the Buddhist patriarch, what other powers do you have that you dare to usurp this hallowed region of heaven? I've plenty of them, said the great sage. Indeed, I know seventy-two transformations, and a life that does not grow old through ten thousand kulpas. I know also how to cloud somersault, and one leap will take me one hundred and eight thousand miles. Why can't I sit on the heavenly throne? The Buddhist patriarch said, Let me make a wager with you. If you have the ability to somersault clear of this right palm of mine, I shall consider you the winner. You need not raise your weapon in battle then, for I shall ask the Jade Emperor to go live with me in the west and let you have the celestial palace. If you cannot somersault out of my hand, you can go back to the region below and be a monster. Work through a few more kulpas before you return to cause more trouble. When the great sage heard this, he said to himself, snickering, what a fool this Tathagata is. A single somersault of mine can carry old monkey 108,000 miles, yet his palm is not even one foot across. How could I possibly not jump clear of it? He asked quickly, you're certain that your decision will stand? Certainly it will, said Tathagata. He stretched out his right hand, which was about the size of a lotus leaf. Our great sage put away his compliant rod and, summoning his power, leaped up and stood right in the center of the patriarch's hand. He said simply, I'm off, and he was gone, all but invisible like a streak of light in the clouds. Training the eye of wisdom on him, the Buddhist patriarch saw that the monkey king was hurtling along relentlessly like a whirligig. As the great sage advanced, he suddenly saw five flesh-pink pillars supporting a mass of green air. This must be the end of the road, he said. When I go back presently, Tathagata will be my witness, and I shall certainly take up residence in the Palace of Divine Mists. But he thought to himself, wait a moment. I'd better leave some kind of memento if I'm going to negotiate with Tathagata. He plucked a hair and blew a mouthful of magic breath onto it, crying, change. It changed into a writing brush with extra thick hair soaked in heavy ink. On the middle pillar he then wrote in large letters the following line, The great sage, equal to heaven, has made a tour of this place. When he had finished writing, he retrieved his hair, and with a total lack of respect he left a bubbling pool of monkey urine at the base of the first pillar. He reversed his cloud somersault and went back to where he had started. 
standing on Tathagata's palm, he said, I left, and now I'm back. Tell the Jade Emperor to give me the Celestial Palace. You pisshead ape, scolded Tathagata. Since when did you ever leave the palm of my hand? The great sage said, you are just ignorant. I went to the edge of heaven, and I found five flesh-pink pillars supporting a mass of green air. I left a memento there. Do you dare go with me to have a look at the place? No need to go there, said Tathagata. Just lower your head and take a look. When the great sage stared down with his fiery eyes and diamond pupils, he found written on the middle finger of the Buddhist patriarch's right hand the sentence, The great sage, equal to heaven, has made a tour of this place. A pungent whiff of monkey urine came from the fork between the thumb and the first finger. Astonished, the great sage said, Could this really happen? Could this really happen? I wrote those words on the pillars supporting the sky. How is it that they now appear on his finger? Could it be that he is exercising the magic power of foreknowledge without divination? I won't believe it. I won't believe it. Let me go there once more. Dear Great Sage Quickly he crouched and was about to jump up again, when the Buddhist patriarch flipped his hand over and tossed the monkey king out of the West Heaven Gate. The five fingers were transformed into the five phases of metal, wood, water, fire, and earth. They became, in fact, five connected mountains, named Five Phases Mountain, which pinned him down with just enough pressure to keep him there. The thunder deities, Ananda and Kasyapa all folded their hands and cried in acclamation. Praise be to virtue! Praise be to virtue! He learned to be human, born from an egg that year, and aimed to reap the authentic way's fruit. He lived in a fine place by kulpas untouched. One day he changed, expending vim and strength. Craving high place, he flouted heaven's reign. Mocked saints and stole pills, breaking great relations. Evil, full to the brim, now meets retribution. We know not when he may find release. After the Buddhist patriarch Tathagata had vanquished the monstrous monkey, he at once called Ananda and Kasyapa to return with him to the western paradise. At that moment, however, Tianping Eleven and Tianyu, two celestial messengers, came running out of the treasure hall of divine mists and said, We beg Tathagata to wait a moment, please. Our Lord's grand carriage will arrive momentarily. When the Buddhist patriarch heard these words, he turned around and waited with reverence. In a moment he did indeed see a chariot drawn by eight colorful phoenixes and covered by a canopy adorned with nine luminous jewels. The entire cortege was accompanied by the sound of wondrous songs and melodies, chanted by a vast celestial choir. Scattering precious blossoms and diffusing fragrant incense, it came up to the Buddha, and the Jade Emperor offered his thanks, saying, We are truly indebted to your mighty Dharma for vanquishing that monster. We beseech Tathagata to remain for one brief day, so that we may invite the immortals to join us in giving you a banquet of thanks. Not daring to refuse, Tathagata folded his hands to thank the Jade Emperor, saying, Your old monk came here at your command, most honorable Deva. Of what power may I boast, really? I owe my success entirely to the excellent fortune of your majesty and the various deities. How can I be worthy of your thanks? The Jade Emperor then ordered the various deities from the Thunder Department to send invitations abroad to the three pure ones, the four ministers, the five elders, the six women officials, twelve the seven stars, the eight poles, the nine luminaries, and the ten capitals. Together with a thousand immortals and ten thousand sages, they were to come to the thanksgiving banquet given for the Buddhist patriarch. The four great imperial preceptors and the divine maidens of nine heavens were told to open wide the golden gates of the jade capital, the treasure palace of primal secret, and the five lodges of penetrating brightness. In a little while, the jade pure celestial worthy of commencement, the highest pure celestial worthy of numinous treasure, the great pure celestial worthy of moral virtue, thirteen the immortal masters of five influences, the star spirits of five constellations, the three ministers, the four sages, the nine luminaries, the left and right assistants, the Devaraja, and Prince Na all marched in leading a train of flags and canopies in pairs. They were all holding rare treasures and lustrous pearls, fruits of longevity, 
and exotic flowers to be presented to the Buddha. As they bowed before him, they said, We are most grateful for the unfathomable power of Tathagata, who has subdued the monstrous monkey. We are grateful, too, to the most honorable Deva, who is having this banquet, and asked us to come here to offer our thanks. May we beseech Tathagata to give this banquet a name? Responding to the petition of the various deities, Tathagata said, If a name is desired, let this be called the Great Banquet for Peace in Heaven. What a magnificent name, the various immortals cried in unison. Indeed, it shall be the Great Banquet for Peace in Heaven. When they finished speaking, they took their seats separately, and there was the pouring of wine and exchanging of cups, pinning of corsages fourteen, and playing of zithers. It was indeed a magnificent banquet, for which we have a testimonial poem. The poem says, That immortal peach feast the ape disturbed is topped by this banquet for peace in heaven. Dragon flags and phoenix carts glow in halos bright. Blazing signs and banners whirl in hallowed light. The tunes and songs divine are sweet and fair. Phoenix pipes and jade flutes both loudly play. Fragrant incense shrouds this assembly of saints. All the world's tranquil to praise the holy court. As all of them were feasting merrily, the Lady Queen Mother also led a host of divine maidens and immortal singing girls to come before the Buddha, dancing with nimble feet. They bowed to him, and she said, Our festival of immortal peaches was ruined by that monstrous monkey. We are beholden to the mighty power of Tathagata for the enchainment of this mischievous ape. In the celebration during this great banquet for peace in heaven, we have little to offer as a token of our thanks. Please accept, however, these few immortal peaches plucked from the large trees by our own hands. They were truly half red, half green, and spouting aroma sweet. These luscious divine roots of ten thousand years. Pity those fruits planted at Wooling Spring. 15. How could they match the marvels of heaven's home? Those tender ones of purple veins so rare in the world. And those peerlessly sweet of pale yellow pits? They lengthen age, prolong life, and change your frame. He who's lucky to eat them will ne'er be the same. After the Buddhist patriarch had pressed together his hands to thank the Queen Mother, she ordered the immortal singing girls and the divine maidens to sing and dance. All the immortals at the banquet applauded enthusiastically. Truly there were whirls of heavenly incense filling the seats and profuse array of divine petals and stems. Jade capital and golden arches in what great splendor. How priceless, too, the strange goods and rare treasures. Every pair had the same age as heaven. Every set increased through ten thousand kulpas. Mulberry fields or vast oceans, let them shift and change. He who lives here has neither grief nor fear. The Queen Mother commanded the immortal maidens to sing and dance, as wine cups and goblets clinked together steadily. After a little while, suddenly, a wondrous fragrance came to meet the nose, rousing stars and planets in that great hall. The gods and the Buddha put down their cups. Raising his head, each waited with his eyes. There in the air appeared an aged man holding a most luxuriant long-life plant. His gourd had elixir often thousand years. His book listed names twelve millennia old. Sky and earth in his cave knew no constraint. Sun and moon were perfected in his vase. 16. He roamed the four seas in joy serene and made the ten islets seventeen his tranquil home. Getting drunk often at the peach's feast. He woke, the moon shone brightly as of old. He had a long head, short frame, and large ears. His name, Star of Long Life from South Pole. After the Star of Long Life arrived and greeted the Jade Emperor, he also went up to thank Tathagata, saying, When I first heard that the baneful monkey was being led by Lousy to the Tishita Palace to be refined by alchemical fire, I thought peace was surely secured. 
I never suspected that he could still escape, and it was fortunate that Tathagata in his goodness had subdued this monster. When I got word of the Thanksgiving banquet, I came at once. I have no other gifts to present to you but these purple agric, jasper plant, jade green lotus root, and golden elixir. The poem says, Jade green lotus and golden drug are given to Sakya. Like the sands of Ganges is the age of Tathagata. The brocade of the three wains is calm, eternal bliss. 18. The nine-grade garland is a wholesome, endless life. 19. The true master of the Madhyamaka school 20. Dwells in the heaven of both form and emptiness. 21. The great earth and cosmos all call him Lord. His sixteen-foot diamond frames great in blessing and age. 22. Tathagata accepted the thanks cheerfully, and the star of long life went to the seat. Again there was pouring of wine and exchanging of cups. The great immortal of naked feet also arrived. After prostrating himself before the Jade Emperor, he too went to thank the Buddhist patriarch, saying, I am profoundly grateful for your dharma, which subdued the baneful monkey. I have no other things to convey my respect, but two magic pairs and some lyre dates, which I now present to you. The poem says, The naked feet immortal brought fragrant pears and dates. To give to Umitba, whose count of years is long. Firm as a hill is his lotus platform of seven treasures. Brocade-like is his flower seat of thousand gold adorned. No false speech is this, his age equals heaven and earth. Nor is this a lie, his luck is great as the sea. Blessing and long life reach in him their fullest scope. Dwelling in that western region of calm, eternal bliss. Tathagata again thanked him and asked Ananda and Kasyapa to put away the gifts one by one before approaching the Jade Emperor to express his gratitude for the banquet. By now, everyone was somewhat tipsy. A spirit minister of inspection then arrived to make the report, the great sage is sticking out his head. No need to worry, said the Buddhist patriarch. He took from his sleeve a tag on which were written in gold letters the words Oh my Padme H. Handing it over to Ananda, he told him to stick it on the top of the mountain. This deva received the tag, took it out of the heaven gate, and stuck it tightly on a square piece of rock at the top of the mountain of five phases. The mountain immediately struck root and grew together at the seams, though there was enough space for breathing and for the prisoner's hands to crawl out and move around a bit. Ananda then returned to report, the tag is tightly attached. Tathagata then took leave of the Jade Emperor and the deities and went with the two devas out of the heaven gate. Moved by compassion, he recited a divine spell and called together a local spirit and the fearless guards of five quarters to stand watch over the five phases mountain. They were told to feed the prisoner with iron pellets when he was hungry and to give him melted copper to drink when he was thirsty. When the time of his chastisement was fulfilled, they were told someone would be coming to deliver him. So it is that. The brash, baneful monkey in revolt against heaven is brought to submission by Tathagata. He drinks melted copper to endure the seasons and feeds on iron pellets to pass the time. Tried by this bitter misfortune sent from the sky, he's glad to be living, though in a piteous lot. If this hero is allowed to struggle anew, he'll serve Buddha in future and go to the West. Another poem says, Prideful of his power once the time was ripe, he tamed dragon and tiger, flaunting wily might. Stealing peaches and wine, he roamed heaven's house. He found trust and grace in the city of Jade. He's now bound, for his evil's full to the brim. By good stock twenty-three unfailing his breath will rise again. If he's indeed to flee to Thagata's hands, he must await from Tang Court the holy monk. We do not know in what month or year hereafter the days of his penance will be fulfilled. Let's listen to the explanation in the next chapter. You are listening to pastthink.com audiobook. Please like and subscribe. Thank you.